And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, Craig, coming to us straight from Heroic Studios. Creators, uh, creators of the Z creator of the Zeton Chronicles, and now mo more recently on webtoon Ultima: The Legend Untold, the one, the one and only, don't call him Wheaton, Mr. Will. How you doing today, man? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, thanks, thanks for bra thanks for braving your way up to the temple and dealing and dealing with um, the hell of time zones. Yeah, that was uh, that was pretty interesting, <laughs> to say the least. Oh, a bit of a tradition for for me is to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, alrighty. I'd like. I'm curious. Wh I'm curious where the where the um, where the writing bug for first bit you, because if I'm not mistaken, these the uh, Zenton Chronicles um came before you did um Ultima. That is well. Okay, there's a catch twenty two there. You're technically correct, then you're also technically wrong. And I gotta say that you're the first person to to pronounce Zenton right. People try to pronounce it and they're like Exton, Zentin. Oh, it's, it's Zenton, so mm -hmm. congratulations for your pronunciation. I really appreciate it. Um appreciate it. Mm -hmm. But no, actually Ultima the Legend Untold came first and then the Zenton Chronicles came little bit later so a little bit of backstory i created my first three characters avion zeta and show when i was still in high school about 10th grade and i mm -hmm. actually did a i guess you can say issue number one for our anime sci-fi club that we had at school um and people liked it i just couldn't find a time to do any other more issues because i was doing it all by hand penciling and all that stuff by myself and it was very very difficult and then printing out copies i used up good lot of paper there to print out the copies and stuff like that so those characters actually came first um mm -hmm. and i wrote them first um they're pretty much the same as they were back then that they are today um just l maybe a little bit more eccentric for some of the characters personalities mainly stro because he's more of a hothead mm -hmm. then he's kind of more of a simpleton at the same time so his personality slightly changed but um, for the most part, they're all pretty much the same. Um, I wrote to Zentown Chronicles when I was ending my first year in um, college. And I wrote those books throughout my entire college career. And actually, Theta Stro and Avion play a major part in those books. So the universe sort of kind of collides. So Ultima The Legend Untold is sort of like a prequel to the book series of the Zentown Chronicles because they do play a major role in that, which is why... I haven't really been pushing my books because if you read those books, it's a huge, huge, huge spoiler for Ultima The Legend Untold, at least until we get through the first arc of the manga Ultima The Legend Untold. So mm -hmm. um, those two kind of sort of complement each other. They're different characters. And if you read the books, um, the Zenton Chronicles, and then you read the manga, they're two different tones to the story there. Like Ultima The Legend Untold is more of a shonen jump kind of... Um, story that's one of those things that's kind of episodic you got a little funny moments you got some serious moments here you got the main story happening and you're trying to figure out what's going on here with this story and the Zentan Chronicles is a little bit of that but it's more of a serious tone in the coming of age story there with their main characters but the worlds do collide and it's pretty interesting um how we're going to do that and I'm, I'm thinking about doing the manga adaptation of the Zentan Chronicles later on but I, I still got to get through a lot of what I want to do with Ultima the Legend Untold first. Yeah. Now, when it comes, you now um, with Ultima, it's vi it's very cl it's very clear that um, that sh I'd, that manga, especially Shonen Battle manga, was a was a ma was a major influence. And um, with some of the exaggerations, I'm get I can I can see a little bit of um, Full Metal Alchemist, which kind of straddles the line about whether it's a sh whether it's a shonen series, but I, I can't really classify it as a shonen battle series. Um. Be beyond the, beyond that, what were beyond beyond the obvious entries in those genres, and even beyond that, what were some of the other major um, influences with Ultima? 
Mm, good question. Well, obviously, there's a lot of uh, Dragon Ball Z in there. Mm -hmm. um, not in the terms of, like, powering up, but whenever you read a shonen manga, there's always, like, I don't know why there is, and whoever came up with the idea of a shonen manga, um, there's always, like, power levels and stuff like that where people are expecting to see, like, a new form or a new power level reach and stuff like that. And I kind of like that concept, like, going forward with these characters, like, creating more of... Uh, I wouldn't say a power level display, but, you know, changing forms. Like, I've always think about what would Arian look in this form or what mm -hmm. would Aiden Show look in this form and stuff like that. And it, it always interests me because I I grew up, when I was growing up, we always looked at that. We were mm -hmm. like, oh, I wonder what this form is going to be like. Even when they revitalized Dragon Ball Z into Dragon Ball Super, you had Super Saiyan God and then you had Super Saiyan Blue. Now you got Ultra Instinct. You had all these new forms. Mm -hmm. And you thought that the creators could not go forward past Super Saiyan 3 or Super Saiyan 4, whichever one you want to believe is canon. Yeah. Um, and, it's, and it's interesting there because it's interesting at the same time, but then it's also like a writer's trap because you create these levels and forms. You don't want to make your character OP. Like, because if they're overpowered, then there's no really no reason to keep on with this character. So, well, you've um, all, I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm pretty sure you've you've also um, cons considered the issue of power creep. Yeah, exactly. So it it it, it kind of traps you there. So mm -hmm. you got to be careful. But going back to your question, a lot of my inspiration, I just like to tell stories. Like mm -hmm. I I read Naruto from beginning to end, and it was interesting. Oh, like these major tiny little resolves needed to happen, and then they stretched these resolves out over like thirty, forty chapters, and it was like okay, it wasn't a tangent it wasn't a filler it was actually for the story and it's really interesting that they did that mm -hmm. um another one was uh full metal alchemist and then a lot of it came from when i was coming up with the idea i was watching a show on netflix called dragon prince and mm -hmm. i thought the world that they were creating in there was actually really interesting dragons elves if humans you have all these pretty neat concepts and i'm like eh, that's kind of like the way i see the planet ultima kind of filled um to the brim of these fantasy aspects mm -hmm. not not like um your usual manga or anything like that but like a, a lord of the rings-esque kind of feel to it and i wanted to kind of go with that because before when i wrote the script it was originally supposed to be an animated series and i was practicing or animating them um but you know one man crew here doing like 10 episodes not going to be feasible for me just yet. So I decided i want to tell this story but i want to do it in manga form and then if it gets catches fire we can keep on going. If it catches mm -hmm. more fire, then we can go ahead and do an actual anime, get a team together, maybe do a crowdfund and get this thing going. But mm -hmm. my inspirations come from all walks of life, all from everywhere. Some personal stories are in this thing. Some stories that I wrote when I was like 16 are in there based on various scenarios that I wanted to kind of explore with these characters and make them more fun mm -hmm. and relatable to the audience. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the Z when it comes to the Zenton Chronicles, um, now just go just going with just going with the art and go and going with some of that. I'm cur I'm curious if um, if to if Tokusatsu in general and um, Power Rangers specifically was an influence. Absolutely, I can totally vouch for that. I love Power Rangers. Have you? If you're watching any of my videos. You see my background, my helmets, all the mm -hmm. things that I like to do. Yes, it was. Completely um, inspired by Tokusatsu because, I mean, even American Power Rangers and Japanese Power Rangers are pretty interesting. I kind of lean more towards the Super Sentai because the stories are more elaborate and they're not as episodic as the American version of it here. Um, but, yeah, when I was first creating those characters, they were wearing the spandex, they were wearing the cool helmets and stuff like that. And then I just, I think it was after watching the first Iron Man movie, I thought about why don't I make them more armor like like their suits instead of making it spandex make it more armor like and make it mm, like their knights mm -hmm. so to speak and that's where i came up with the idea of the zenton which if you look at the artwork it's not really spandex it's, it's actually full-on it, armor it's got more in com i'd say it has more in common with common rider than super sentai um visually yeah in a sense it does and you can see one of the zenton has already appeared in the manga there um, we call that person the stranger mm -hmm. or the armored stranger because we don't really know more about this person um, at all. So it's very interesting because a lot of people who have read my books who are now reading the manga, 
um, they kind of pointed that out. They go, wait, this is a story that takes place before the Zenton Chronicles, but they're saying the same universe was the Zenton doing on this planet. And it's going to be a fun reveal when we finally reveal what's going on here with this person. Yeah. And I'm really excited to get there. I, I, I know how I'm going to reveal them. I just don't know when I want to reveal this person and what they've become to be so far and where they come from and stuff like that. But if people are trying to connect the dots already saying, oh, is this is this person? No, it isn't. But, you know, if you read the books, you kind of might figure it out. But that reveal is going to be very important as we go along with the story. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, some now with some with some authors that I've had that I've had on the show, they um they end up making a care they end up making a universe and then make their characters, and some people make a character and then make the universe. Where would you say that you fall in that paradigm? I definitely created the characters first before I created the universe. Um, I'm really big on character element, like. You can create a universe all you want, but if you don't have any good characters within that universe, then your universe is going to be crap. I focus a lot on characters and motivations, what they're doing, how they act, how they behave in certain scenarios. I focus on creating those characters first before I decided to create a universe. Mm -hmm. And truth be told, when it comes to this kind of thing, I don't think there's a right and ro or wrong way to do it. It's ju right. it's just a matter of um, what's what someone what someone's going to fall into, but Right. Um. A lot. I remember. I've. I. I remember. I remember someone I was speaking with a long time ago had mentioned the importance of a series Bible. Um. You know that just cont just contains all the thing all the things that are going to be needed for the world that the story takes place in to make sure everything's mm -hmm. consistent. When when you were when you were set when you were setting up the books and the manga did you ha did you have that to make sure in order to make sure that something that happens in one is going is going to be still consistent um, between the two? Yes and no. Um, I had the whole roadmap of what the story I wanted to tell already laid out. Mm -hmm. In each book, I had bullet points on what I wanted to occur in order to push the plot forward. Now, plot holes happen. You can't really control that because there's a lot of details and concepts that you're going to throw into a book that you're not necessarily going to remember going forward. I've done that and I look back on that and I ask myself, do I want to change it or do I want to keep it the same? Bottles are going to happen. And if you worry about creating bottles all the time and ask yourself, well, this character can't do this because on page 94 of book one, they did this and it won't make sense. And you're going to drive yourself nuts. And you're going to drive yourself up a wall and you're not going to want to write it anymore. What I would suggest people do is write the story the way you want to write it and then make sure that it feels good to you on forward. Because when you get on, I know there's a lot of people on YouTube who are just analyzing movies and shows and stuff like that. And they, they start to point out the plot holes. And I'm, I'm like that, too. Ever since I started doing movie reviews, I'm able to point out plot holes in a lot of movies and stuff like that. Sometimes you just got to turn your brain off. People do still enjoy stories that contain plot holes. Mm -hmm. um, your job as a writer is not to try and cover up the plot hole with some generic piece of exposition that's going to explain why something is like this. No. You have to focus on writing a story and creating a story that's going to trump those plot holes. Now, if the story doesn't make sense and people are finding out the plot holes, then that's a different story. But, for example, Harry Potter, there's a ton of plot holes in Harry Potter, but people like the Harry Potter books because they're good stories to tell and the characters are very fun to read about and stuff like that. So, like I said, you can't really control plot holes. The best thing you can do is to make sure that you do plan your story out, whether it's with... The, the the playbook that you mentioned before mm -hmm. or something in your head that you want to just make as clear as possible. Story is always going to be full of plot holes and there's yeah. nothing you can really do about that. And people are going to find it whether it be tomorrow or 20 years from now when you're a best-selling author. It's going to happen. And to be to be honest, I I think I think a, I think a lot of um I think a lot of readers uh, read I think a lot of readers of, of various media are a lot more forgiving than so, than some people would li would like to think, because um, right. so so long as, so long as the as the destination makes the journey worth it, 
I think I think people are willing to forgive a lot a lot of um a lot of plot holes or sim or similar kinds of um bullshit. Right. It's what it's when the it's when the it's when the um it's when the it's when you're breaking that relationship that's when you really start to have the problems um that's where that's where you get that's where you end up going full Shyamalan never go full right. Shyamalan and, and you want to like you you want to keep the readers and your audience guessing but you don't want to shit on the readers if you wrote four books and you're about to release your fifth and the fifth one is just this whole mess of a story because you didn't properly plan it out like you want the twist to be meaningful you want the conclusion to be meaningful you want the climax to be meaningful these people have been reading your work or watching your show reading your comic for however many issues or books and when you get to the point that's really going to be a drastic turn in the story you want it to be meaningful not just make it to where all this build up was basically for nothing like if you're going to write a book if you're going to tell a story you have to make sure Wherever you're going with your story, it is clearly defined and it's planned out 100%. Yep. And I'm guilty of that too. I've, I've had, I think I've edited my books at least a good three or four times just to make sure that the lead up and the build up that are leading to certain reveals make sense and that the dialogue is on point. Now, I haven't read my books in years and I refuse to read them, but I know I'm going to have to revisit them at some point if I plan on doing a manga adaptation or a comic book adaptation. But mm -hmm. Um, from what I've heard about the books thus far, people don't really have anything negative to say about them. So they 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 are what they are. They're they they're. But I'm sure there's going to be you know some hardcore critics coming out of the world works later on um, that are going to do that, and that's fine. Do mm -hmm. it. I, I'm open to criticism to make my writing better than what it was. But also remember that these books were written damn near 10 years ago so the writing style that i have acquired now is not the writing style that these books remain in yeah completely different <laughs> um now per person i'm not sure if you've seen it but personally the one of the poster childs i'll use when it comes to screwing up the destination is miracle day the um thir the the uh i believe it was the fourth season of torchwood that was co-produced by stars um it was a collaborative effort between um, Stars and the BBC. Okay, I'm not really familiar with that, but continue. Yep. Um, short ver short version. It was a short version. Tor Torchwood was a Doctor Who spinoff that dealt with stories that didn't necessarily involve the Doctor. Um. And they and one of its claims to fame is having one having a former Buffy writer um involved with it. Um. Not not Joss. Thank good, thank goodness, I've got my issues with him. Um, <laughs> but it's just, but um, when it came to Miracle Day, the whole instead of instead of doing a bunch of standalones, the whole series was was one overarching story. That's the that's the intent. The problem the problem is, um, there was a whole lot of activity, but not a lot of movement, and the destination did not validate the journey that that people had gone on for 12 weeks mm -hmm. uh, which which is what which is why that whole which is why i find that whole phrase that it's not the it's not the um destination it's the journey i think that i think that's a load of crap <laughs> it is because you want you gotta ultimately go somewhere like mm -hmm. shows that go on or like 15 seasons 17 seasons and shit like that it gets very tiresome. For example, like the CW DC shows, like The Flash. The first two seasons were great. Season three was mad. Season four is like, what the fuck are you doing? Season five is okay, I'm done. Season six, you're like, okay, the show needs to end now. Now they're on season seven, and you have no idea what's going on here. Well, I know what's going watch. on. They're trying to bring. They're trying to introduce Impulse with one of the uh, with one of the ugliest <laughs> costume designs I've seen since Batwoman. Oh, like, don't, don't even get me started. Like, The Flash used to be my staple. Like, every season I would look forward to The Flash. Mm -hmm. I would watch The Flash, Arrow, Legends of Tomorrow, all these shows. Now, it doesn't seem like any of these shows have a clear destination. When Arrow finally ended, I'm like, thank God this show is over. Because you guys were just turning your gears in order to get those ratings. And those ratings constantly fell over the course of the show. Now, The Flash is here. Uh, I don't even watch it anymore. Like I watched it when it returned after the COVID thing, and 
I don't even know who this black dude is that's in the show. Who is this other black dude? Like, where did he come from? What is he doing? I don't know him. Like, where did he come from? I Like, the characters are so unrelatable. They really just butchered that show. And it could have been something that mm-hmm. was great. Season one of the show was fantastic because you have the reverse Flash, who I'm still rooting for, who's hopefully is going to come back and just obliterate the entire team and just make it the reverse Flash show because that would be great. But you got season one, season two, season three. Like I said, those seasons were okay. Mm-hmm. Season three being least likable, in my opinion, with Savitar. Um, season four with the Thinker was mad. Season five, I don't even remember season five. Was it with Cicada? I don't remember. These shows overstay their welcome because the writers have no clear goal in where they want to go. Now, the exception to that would be Supernatural because the show was supposed to end after five seasons. They were telling the story over the course of the five seasons, this whole overarching narrative of Lucifer and Michael at the very end, and it was supposed to be this big climactic battle. But the show was so popular that it ended up being um, continued on after season five, and it went for another ten seasons after that. And each season had its defined goal. I don't think the, the writers were going for another you know, five, ten seasons of overarching narrative, they focused on a season and they told that story within that season. And then when the next season came, there was another focus on what they were doing in that season. There wasn't no callbacks to, like, season three or anything like that. As we got to the end of the show, sure, you had to call back season five with Lucifer and Michael and what happened to Michael here and who's God and what was God doing this whole time? Of course, because you're trying to wrap up 15 years of storytelling. But... From season 6 over to about season 11 or 12, mm-hmm. maybe, those seasons told their own story, and it was, this is what we're going to do for this season, let's write it, we're going to move on to the next season, figure out another arcing narrative for that season only, and then go forward. And that's, the, that's the exception there. But these shows, they're trying to do the exact same thing, where right? also trying to tell an overarching narrative that doesn't make sense, in my opinion. I can't, there's nothing good on TV anymore. I tried. I can't oh. do it. <laughs> funny thing funny thing is when it comes if somebody were to if somebody were to look at what i'm watching when it comes to tv it's 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 either it's either anime tokusatsu um a, or it or um some 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 shows that are hard to find and indie wrestling <laughs> is yeah what, i mean most of my entertainment comes from YouTube, honestly. Mm-hmm. Like, I really don't watch anything else. The last good shows that I watched was Invincible, which was really good. I love that show. And um, I just finished Attack on Titan. Yeah. And those shows were very, very good. Uh, I tried to get into, like, um, well, we, we we really didn't have fall TV this year because of COVID. But mm-hmm. I really tried to get into some new shows. Um, but I, I don't know, man. I just... I know what the writing is going for. I know, like, sometimes it's probably my biased opinion. But I know what the writers are aiming for with these shows. They're trying to get woke. They're trying to put in all these politics into their storytelling. And it just doesn't work because you put these politics before actual character development and storytelling. And it doesn't work. And they're not getting the idea. And that's why no one's watching any of these shows anymore. Because you're not telling a cohesive story. You're not telling anything that's... People are interested in and that's the problem they want to know why people are flocking to anime and manga all the time it's because the japanese they don't put identity politics into their books they tell a damn story the story turns out to be freaking amazing even sometimes the filler that they throw in there it's like oh this is great i thought this was part of the main story no nope. you'd bring it back to the main arc you'd probably get you'd probably get a kick out of thunderbolt fantasy um it's just it's just not one where I could where I could recommend the official release because because whoever because whoever was handling the subtitling screwed up. Oh. Right, and, and then that's another thing too. Like the subtitling with Funimation, man, all that shit coming from Funimation too. How they're trying to insert woke politics into anime via the dubbing, and it's like, stop it. Just don't worry what about I, any of that. <laughs> what I find what I find um. What I f- what I find f- what I find funny is that th- is that whenever somebody tries to do it, it's usually with what it's usually with a a show that isn't a doesn't ha- doesn't have a major footprint. So ev- e- for as for as strongly held as their beliefs are, they're not they're not um 
it's a it's it's a case where every, everybody 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 strongly belie- believes in whatever they happen to believe in until they might get punched in the face. Um, right. Like the whole the the whole thing with trying there was that whole tr- there was that whole trend a few years ago with trying to with trying to sneak in a um a a bit of LGBT pandering in like in like the last scene in the last episode. Um whenever those were done it was it was always done when the show was already on its way out and yeah. and, and everybody knew it so they just sneak that in because what are they going to do cancel us twice um right but if um but i'm sitting here going if you really be- if you really believe that have the balls to actually go th- have the balls to actually go through with it like i have a lot i have a lot more respect for when when um st- when having having Uhur- having Uhura kissing kirk in Star Trek, in the middle of, in the middle of the se- of the series, I have a high I have a higher regard for than than somebody do than somebody trying to sneak that trying to sneak something similar in at the at, at the series finale of something. Right, and mm-hmm. that I like the Star Trek movies. Those the J.J. Abrams, like people have all this hate for J.J. Abrams. I don't think he's <laughs> that bad of a writer. He does the mystery box thing, like. I call really I call him well. the I call J.J. J. Abrams the California role of directors. Pretty much, because <laughs> you you can tolerate him up into a certain extent, but like whenever when he, he Star Trek movies, he's, they were good. He, when he he is somebody who um if whenever when if you need if you need to have a fun visually engaging ride, he's he's ideal. But mm-hmm. if you need to, if whenever he tries to do a story with any degree of sophistication, he's go, he's going to fall flat because his his big a lot of people think his problem is lens flares. No, that's just a red herring. His problem is he has a he has a lot of activity happening, but there isn't a whole lot of um, movement, a whole lot of progression. You're just it's a lot of um, reshuffling pieces on a chessboard. Right is like- his problem. When I watched Star Trek, I was like, oh, this is really good. Like, I wasn't really a big Star Trek fan, but my mom is a huge Star Trek fan. So we went to go see uh, Star Trek 2009. I'm like, wow, this is really good in terms of, like, the the cinematography, the music, the acting. Everything was great. And then Star Trek Into Darkness was great. Star Trek Beyond was kind of meh, but he didn't direct that. It was the dude from the, I think, the Fast and the Furious movie. So you can kind of see the difference there. There's a downgrade. You know, this is the same guy that... Yeah, it was a hella downgrade, and you're like, you can see like the the green screen shaking, and the renderings are not all there. You can tell that this wasn't J.J. Abrams stuff, but I, I it's a fun movie to watch for the most part for what it is. Sure, but Into Darkness and the first Star Trek was great, and then you figured out I figured out that he did Lost. J.J. Abrams wrote Lost. I'm like, this is really good, and then you watch Super Eight, and you're like, this is crap. What the hell happened here? I don't understand. So J.J. Sup- Abrams has his. He has his hits and he has his misses. Yeah. It's like with all directors and creators. You have your hits, you have your misses. You know, don't focus on the misses. Focus on what you're good at. And, you know, I'm looking forward to whatever you know, next Star Trek movie he comes out with next, if he's actually doing if there, if there Star even, Trek movie. If there even is one, because because there's been, there's been the... Because for a while there's been, there's been this massive slap fight where you have too many cooks in the kitchen. Because... Yep. You have... Because, um... You have the you have the fact that Vi- that um that Viacom I think it was um Viacom um C- CBS actually no not actually never mind that they um they ended up merging but you have no oh, it was it was um Vi- it was CBS and Paramount who merged so you have this whole thing between CBS Paramount and and Viacom and each and both and both sides can't seem to agree about what direction to go in which is mm-hmm. which is why which is why they've tried they've tried to do um do these smaller scale things even if some of them were bad ideas like say lower decks which was basically trying to throw in family guy into star into um star trek mm-hmm. when family guy has already worn out its welcome um yep family guy needs to go because it's like the simpsons and family guy i'm just gonna add this in there it's kind of like the simpsons they're trying to evolve with the times like simpsons it become woke too. I can't watch anything past season thirteen because it just doesn't make sense to me anymore. Family mm-hmm. Guy, same thing. 
I think the only thing I can watch in Family Guy up to is the episode where Brian and Stewie go to the North Pole. That is the only, that's as far as I can go. I can't go further than that because the jokes are just meh. Everything is just kind of just forced in there. And I honestly didn't know that they did another season. I thought the show was kind of like on that indefinite hiatus, but I've been known to be wrong. So. Mm-hmm. Um, and when, and the reason the reason why the reason why I bring up the a lot of these things is, I have noticed, and you've probably noticed as well, a tr- a trend where a lot of pe- a lot of people, because of the fact that because of the fact that the bi- that the big response was to was to say, well, if you don't like it, why don't you try why don't you try making making your own series, and. You, several other comic creators, I've had several other game creators, I've I've had on I've had up in the temple have have taken that and said challenge accepted. <laughs> right. Um. Of course. Um. And I, th- if there, if nothing else, a lot of a lot of the failings of of those <laughs> of those types of shows, um, provide a provide a very excellent lesson in what not to do. Um. I remember. Yep. I remember Vincent Flanders once say, once saying that um, the best way to the best way to learn a craft is not only to study its tenets but its pitfalls. And yep. he would later go on to um, to set up a site called Web Pages That Suck, which is all about teaching good web design by showing um, bad web design. But getting getting to saner matters um, now. When it comes to when it comes to the Zenton Chronicles and and Ultima. Um, were, did you, were, when, were those originally designed as separate projects that you decided to combine into one universe, or did you always have the intention of doing a, of doing this shared universe between the two? Actually, no. The Zentai Chronicles was supposed to be its own thing. Um, when I was writing book two, The Invasion of the Cults, I decided, the very last minute, why don't I put in Zeta Stro and Avion in this book? That'll be interesting because I haven't touched these characters and it would be good to see how they will interact, you know, on paper and kind of go from there. Originally, the Zenton Chronicles were supposed to be its own thing. I wasn't even in mindset or even trying to fathom what it would be like to create a universe. I was just wanting to write a book. I was wanting to write a story. That was it. Creating a whole universe and way later when I decided to, once I finished up the books, because I, I liked the way it went. Um, but Zeta Stro and Avion, um, those characters, they were shoehorned into the book at the last minute. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to, you know, like I said, revisit those characters because I hadn't touched them by the time I wrote book two of the Zentar Chronicles for at least a good you know, four or five years, maybe. And it was good to get them in there make them allies with the current book heroes um but they they were not main characters and that's where the title comes from because anybody like i said who's read our books like you get a lot of exposition behind the zentan behind um zeta strove and avion's story within the zentan chronicles but you don't get to experience it so that's why the title is called ultima the legend untold because Mm -hmm. it's technically an untold story, an untold legend that people who read the books don't really understand or know. They just know it through exposition. And through those expositions, some of it, I guess you can call it a retcon if you want, but some of it was just kind of like one of those things that I didn't want to reveal just yet. And I wasn't really sure that I was going to tell their story. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if I was going to do that or not. But I know that the lore and the mythology behind what they are and what they're doing and their story is very, very interesting. And I, I think people are going to like where the manga goes going forward. Mm-hmm. Now, with a, with a lot of, um, with a lot of, ba- with a lot of battle series, um, out, outside to, to a lesser, to a lesser degree with stuff, with stuff like DBZ, but for a much, for a much greater degree with battle series that came out afterwards, especially ones that have come out in the last, um, Ten or so years, there's always there's always been an emphasis to ma- to maintain a set of rules regarding the a bit regarding the abilities. I I 
it it would be temp it would be tempting to call it to call it the to call it rules of a magic system, but sometimes sometimes magic isn't even involved. Sometimes it's key. Sometimes it's so something else entirely. But mm -hmm. when you when you were set, when you were setting up the when you were setting up the world, did you make sure to make to maintain a set of rules so that stays consistent? Yes and no. Um, with Ultimate the Legend Untold, there mm -hmm. really isn't a magic system. Um, there are spells that, obviously, if you read up until now, Zeta casts from time to time to mm -hmm. kind of help with this show, I mean, assist the show. So it's kind of like that dynamic with, like, Dungeons and Dragons, where you have your, your support character, which is, you know, sometimes it's Zeta, but Zeta sometimes kind of comes out and does his own thing and sometimes ends up being more of the main forefront warrior than mm -hmm. Shaw is. You know, their dynamic... It's very, very binary. So you have Zeta, who's more like a the brains and the calm collector. He just knows what to do when the time comes to do it. Straw, on the other hand, doesn't think. He just rushes in blind headed, blindly, and he ends up making the problem a lot worse than what it is. And Avion is sort of just kind of caught in the middle. Sometimes he'll side with Straw, and they'll have their fun times, and sometimes they'll argue. Sometimes he'll, you know, take lessons from Zeta and understand what it is that they you know need to do and he's kind of like i would say a mix between the both of them because he's more influential influential between the two of them at this point mm -hmm. um but going back to your question i didn't really design a magic system to be honest all i know is that i there there are certain rules that you have to follow in order for this to make sense like shro is the swordsman um he's going to be the power you got zeta who's basically like the brains who understands of spells work and can cast these spells and you have Avion who's kind of like in between both of them but when it came to the Zentire Chronicles and when it came to book four it did have to create a system in which the ultimate um destination if you will um of w where the characters are going to be at the end needed to kind of sort of not be overpowered because if it's overpowered then you don't want to kind of continue the story from there there have to be rules mm -hmm. And you're creating, um, let's say, for example, a celestial like being, like who can cross dimensions or even time. There has to be rules that need to be put in place. And at the end of the Zentai Chronicles, those rules weren't clearly defined. So I decided to write um, kind of like an in between book that kind of explains um, where this character who has finally fulfilled their destiny where they have to follow a certain set of rules in order for them to be what I call a cosmic being mm -hmm. so to speak so there are rules and if you're going to go cosmic or godlike whatever you want to do you have to create these rules you can't have these people just be in a book because then you're going to start asking yourself well why didn't they do this there are rules for characters that i've created that are in that are cosmic beings sure where they can't interfere in certain scenarios they can kind of meddle but they can't really do much in terms of this and you know a lot of people in my head i would say you know if this character was here the whole time. Why didn't they do anything? And mm -hmm. you got to ask yourself that question. Why didn't they do anything and then create those constraints around um, those characters and what they are? So Ultimate the Legend Untold, there are rules. There are systems that I've devised. But as of now, the character's abilities are just so minuscule at this point that they that they don't really matter. They won't matter until we get to the, the meat and potatoes of what's going on in this story. Yeah, and the other one of the other things I found interesting when I look at um, Ultima is the level is the level of technology because it's um it's definitely in that and a it's definitely in that mix kind of kind of setup where you you have classical fantasy approaches to to villages and the like, but the te but you also have technology that w that is a little bit more on the speculative end of things yeah um and a lot of people were just you know asking me about that you know if they have the ability to create holograms or store data why do they need fire instead of not using electricity you know um it's one of those things that i wanted to kind of explore because you if you're following the way that certain civilizations are going to discover things based on our civilization, humanity. Mm -hmm. It's not fun. It's not fun at all. So a, a, a civilization could create holograms. Holograms do 
require some type of power source, electricity, let's say that. But maybe this civilization is just so used to using fire to heat pots and, you know, cook things with that that could be, you know, a viable reason. So I wanted to mix it with the fantasy and the magic and the technology just to kind of make it a fun thing um, to, for, for people to kind of understand and enjoy because you don't need a futuristic civilization to enjoy let's say um, a hologram like mm -hmm. you can still be building houses out of wood and still be able to use holograms or space lasers or floating pirate ships or space pirates and stuff like that a lot of this stuff i wanted to just kind of mold into it and i'm kind of just making it up as i go because you have to sort of kind of in the rules a little bit when it comes to world building like if you have technology why are you still using magic if you have magic why would you use a hologram when you can just use magic to do that you know and it, it, it's fun to kind of to build that that world you know you got people who can teleport across the planet using certain technologies but they still carry torches in the woods or <laughs> stuff like that so it's interesting and i wanted mm -hmm. to kind of explore those options i can i can get i can get that um now, when it come now, so the other thing that I find interesting was the was the introduction of the whole language barrier because um, structured languages in in um, fiction is something that isn't tackled as often as as I'd like to, and mm -hmm. I'm cur I'm curious if um, I'm curious how you how you came about that whole thing. Did you end up did you end up making a structured language or? Was it was it a play it by ear kind of situation? Actually, was and I actually when I like I said I wrote this to be a um, animated series, so I needed to come up with a language, and so I took inspiration from Spanish and Japanese languages and kind of mixed them together to kind of make up this new system of languages um, that only Zeta Stro and Avion could understand and speak, and I wanted it to be interesting because that's the whole hook of it. Because when you see they didn't show are freed and they're speaking this language that no one can understand. But you see Avion kind of keeping up with what's going on between um, the three of them and Zale. It kind of answers the question, wait, they're speaking another language. How is this kid able to understand what they're saying? Because I'm trying to establish that these three people are connected. And I thought that creating this language barrier and Avion being the only one who can understand them would be a sort of an interesting kind of push there. So... When I decided to turn it into a manga instead of an animated series, I did not take into account like making the translations. Yeah, because they are. So if you read like the first few chapters, the translations are on the bottom, and mm -hmm. a lot of people had some an issue with that. So going forward, I, I just decided to put translated from ancient Italian at the top to kind of understand that this is a translation of what they're saying. But there is a doctored language that I created that is still in the original script. Um, to this day, yeah. but I'm I'm guessing I mean, I'm guess I'm guessing that I'm guessing that you don't have any plans on put on putting out a document that on on how someone could speak it. You're not going full Klingon with this. <laughs> no, I, I'm not. To be honest, it's like I had the the system created when I was writing the first to the point to where I had to look up into the pseudo dictionary that I that I created in order to get the conjugation rights and stuff like that. It was really super intense, but going forward into the script it just became so tedious because I had to think of the conjugation and the tense that we were using in order to make this work and it was very very just off the walls. It was turning more into focusing on how the language is going to work rather than focusing on the story and where the characters are going to go. So I kind of Halfway through writing the script for I think episode four, I just decided that I'm just gonna put in subtext, speak in different language, and just kind of make up the text going from there instead of spending like it was hours spinning on trying to make up a sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, sentence based on the system that I had created. It was just so tedious, so I just decided to kind of cut that out and just focus on writing the story as opposed to just creating this language. I remember. I remember. Um... I remember, I remember the I remember um Gygax just do, just doing Gygaxian as right as just writing things backwards and um I I did a few things not too far not too far off from that but instead instead of instead of writing things backwards I used a 
I used a random number generator with each, with all 26 letters of the alphabet. Right, it would just roll a, a random number from one to 26, then roll, then um, take that number, then take that number off, and just keep going. Yeah. Um. And you had to you had to make the words to where you could pronounce them though. So they, they had to have been vowels and stuff like that, and off to be here in like weird places in order to make it look like it's something, you know, otherworldly, I, and it was too tedious. I was a, I was able to cheat in that case because the because the. In that particular instance, the structured language I was used was intent was intended to be a written cipher. Um, because I don't maybe it's maybe it's because I maybe it's because I gr I grew up with with my with my fair share of spy fiction, but I've always liked um secret codes and the like. Right. Um, I was gonna do that too because I know a lot of Zelda games they do that, and that's where I kind of got the idea to make. You know, an actual written language, not to Romanize it, but to have like, you know, their own alphabet and stuff like that. But that we're getting into a whole different realm. Of yeah, that's uh, here. <laughs> if if now there are there are methods to go down that rabbit hole, but if you go down that rabbit hole, um, you're not coming out. <laughs> no, you're not. And I know a lot of people who have tried to create their own language with the whole um, symbols and everything, and it just doesn't. They, you don't finish it because creating a language and a world centered around that language is another whole feat in itself. And I don't think people have the actual patience to do that. Yeah, I mean, if you do, kudos. But to me, I want to focus on story and getting these characters to where I want them to go mm -hmm. and go from there. Like, if I wanted to create another language, I would have done the language first and then built the world around it. But this was the story first and then the language idea kind of came secondary. And I didn't want to spend too much time creating a language when I wanted to tell this story because the story would have probably still be in production because me trying to create this language is in and of itself a project of his own. I mean, Tolkien was able to get away with it simply because of his background. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And people are always trying to be like Tolkien and I'm like, guys, like, the dude had a lot of time on his hands. I don't think we have that much time <laughs> at all. And we're all easily distracted with phones and you know Instagram and stuff like that. So if you can really focus... Again, kudos, but I hate to say it. Some of us have an attention span of a goldfish. So, for me, it's it's less of an it's less of an attention span and more of one of more of wanting to pace myself so I wouldn't so I wouldn't burn out when I um hit, when I hit a writer's block. Yeah, because it's and going to of, it's going to happen. Hit that. And I, I get writer's block, and it's worse for me because it's not only writer's block; it's also what am I going to draw in this next cell because I have the whole script written out up in, until oh. Hang. the end of the book. Be because it was written to be an animated series first and I had to convert it over to a manga, a lot of the script has changed and I have to go back and do rewrites. So because I have to do rewrites, some of the stuff that I originally thought up in terms of animating can't be translated properly into a manga, so um, I get a, not only writer's block, but drawer's block, too, and that's what's really kind of slowing down production because I'm changing everything, but mm -hmm. um, we're back on track now, so going forward, um, it's going to be really interesting now that I got what I want to do now. Yeah. Um, and speak, speaking, speaking of um, artist block in that regard, um, when it comes to when it came when it came to trying to trying to vi trying to visualize cer certain um, scenes, were there were there any instances you can think of where um, the visualiza the visualization and the way the um, panels were going just didn't match up? Um, yeah, when I when I do the first fight in Clade Village mm -hmm. with the giant monster gorilla thing, um, I had no clear. No clear vision on what I wanted the the houses to look like. Like you, this is why you don't see like a full house from time to time because it's. I did really wanted it to be a unique setting, mm -hmm. but the only thing I could think about was like old German houses or like old medieval houses that didn't really match up. So this is why during the fight with this giant monster, a lot of the buildings look like blocks because I wanted to fill out the scene to the point to where you can get immersed. So I kind of regret that. Because mm -hmm. now I'm able to kind of build architecture a bit better now. So going forward, like in the later chapters, you'll see a lot better architecture 
you see a lot better scenes and stuff like that because I was able to figure out what I wanted to draw to where it doesn't look so modern, like in the real world, but also look alien, but at the same time have this fantasy feel to it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there's sometimes because I was giving myself really impossible deadlines, I needed to draw like a chapter a month, which usually is like 24 pages. We're completely lettered and ready to go and ready for um, posting. Um, so I really didn't have a lot of time to sit and wonder how I'm going to do these architecture buildings. How are they going to look? I didn't have the time to do that. And I should have figured that out before I started drawing. But I was just so excited about the project that I just wanted to get started. But now um, I'm not giving myself any kind of deadlines because I want to focus on making the art better. I wanted to kind of bring out a little bit more story the art and the 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 way the art wanted to look so this is why i think after the next couple updates you're going to see a drastic change in the way the art is being um handled like the art now from like now compared to like page one of chapter one is completely different so you're going to see a drastic change in art going forward after this um next couple of updates all right now I'll, I'll certainly be looking forward to that also, when it comes to some of the art, I, 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 I would be remiss if I didn't point out that there's uh, that there's because you're you're as much of a nerd as any, as anybody else I've ha- I've had on and nerds lo- and nerds love re- nerds love referencing. So mm-hmm. when, so reading through Ultima has been has been a bit of a scavenger hunt, including the image that's on the that's on the front page of the site, which I was like, well, some somebody's been watching Obari anime. <laughs> well, I I I don't. To be honest with you, I have no idea what that means. So, could you um, <laughs> elaborate a little bit? The the Im- the uh, image the image with the sword and that that particular pose. Masumi Obari does that a lot in his um me- in his mech anime. That per- that particular uh, pose. Yeah, I got that. Yeah, okay, I get what you're saying. Did that that pose, and when I was drawing the promo images for that, I wanted something like that. But I didn't really take a pose on the internet. I have these little drawing mm-hmm. figures. Um, they're they're actually they have replaceable hands, and they're extremely posable. I went and 3D printed a sword, and I I made that pose um, through these figures and took a picture and drew it just like that. So. Mm-hmm. These, when you can't find a reference online, and there's been instances to where I couldn't find the references that I was looking for online, I took these figures and I have like a good, I have two men and I have two women, two female um, these figures. I make the pose that I'm looking for and use my camera to get the perspective that I want, and then I draw it that way. Upload it to my computer, put it into the canvas, and then I start drawing over that. Yeah. It makes life so much easier. So I wanted that because I really wanted to show off that sword and i'm already getting people asking me when are they going to get the sword you have them with these weapons they haven't gotten them yet people were getting there we're getting there really fast so <laughs> just sit tight the, the, when you get to the weapons it's going to be a lot of fun because of our, i've come up with some pretty cool finishers that yeah. these characters are going to use cool concepts with their weapons it's going to be fun so yeah i like that pose a lot and i really had a lot of fun drawing that pose um and I sh- j- as a case in point, I'm gonna send you some. I'm gonna send you an image that just shows how prevalent this particular uh, the Obar the Obari pose is in um a- in anime. Um, yeah. Just look at it in Marvel. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's pretty there, and I think it's it's to show off the sword too. Like no one really cares who's holding the sword, but. Like a lot of the stuff, like it looks really cool because you're showing off the weapon. So originally, Stroh's sword was just supposed to be a generic blade, and then I commissioned my artist to go ahead and create a cool-looking blade, like mm-hmm. make it look as great as possible. And he did, and I love the way he came out with it. And I'm I'm going to see if I can send you a picture of it. I haven't really mm-hmm. dealt with um Discord, but. The weapon that he came up with was just great, and I love the way he did it. And when I was doing my email campaign, I actually gave a little backstory on what the weapons were and how they look and what they're made of and stuff like that. And it was really cool. So um, let me see if I can pull that up and I'll, mm-hmm. I can send it to you. I was really excited when he came back and was like, well, this is what I got for you. And I'm like, wow, this looks really good. Mm-hmm. Thank you, good sir. 
<laughs> so and all right, I'm sending you the sword and the staff it's... now. I um, I've often I've often seen some. Something that I end up um, discovering that I find interesting when I come when I came to my own studies is a lot of the things that we find that people may find cliche when it comes to when it when it comes to when it comes to anime, especially especially shonen battle anime, which is which is the one that everybody loves to deri de deride when they want when they want to when they want to try and be too cool to admit that they like it. Um, right. Is is um. Is the fact that a lot of those have a much more long-standing tradition, like the, and this this isn't an anime thing, but I'm just using this as a as a case in point example. The amount the amount of posing that you that you see in a togusatsu work that has its roots all the way back in in um, kabuki, and I'd say, mm -hmm. I'd say I'd say a lot of motifs when it comes when it comes to when it comes to anime have. Have have a good amount had a, a bit more DNA than people are willing to admit with um, Kabuki and No, depending on the genre. Obvious, obviously, a shonen anime isn't going to have a lot of DNA with No theater because the two are complete opposites of each other. Right. Um, for the record, No is very subdued. Um, a lot of a lot of characters a lot of characters wearing black or wearing masks. Um. And of course, it's also where, and of course, and that's also where you have the um, Kurokos, which are stagehands that wear that wear nothing but black and don't talk. Yeah. Um. When Shinkenji came around, the the um, the people who would always set up the stage before transformations, those were Kurokos. Just, okay. Makes sense. Yeah. Um. But let let me see. Let me see what do we. I um I definitely like both of those um, I, I can, I'm guessing I'm mean, was the Legend of Ze was the Legend of Zelda a bit a bit of a influence. Actually, no, no. I, knew I was thinking either I that I keep thinking either that or um Dragon Quest. No, never played Dragon Quest. Um, I played a lot of Zelda, but Zelda wasn't an, uh, an inspiration. Or this because it wasn't really much of a chosen one and needed to find a, a sword or anything like that. Talk about that in the Zenton Chronicles, kind of going through that mythology, but it wasn't Zelda S inspired, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Of the three characters, Zeta, Stro, and Avion, Stro was my first character that I ever created, and I always drew him with two swords mm -hmm. um, because that's, that's, that's how I envisioned him. And so going forward, um, when I came up with um, Zeta, they were originally supposed to be brothers, twins actually, but I wanted them to have their own distinct personality, and so I gave Zelda, I mean, Zeta the bangs and the mm -hmm. long hair to kind of distinguish them apart from each other and gave them personalities, and that's where he had his staff, and then Stro had his sword. So, mm -hmm. I always wanted Stro to have two swords in the beginning of the series when he first gets his weapon. He's only going to have one sword, but then um, that rule is going to apply there with the whole magic constraints. I wouldn't even call it magic, just how the weapons behave, mm -hmm. where he's going to eventually have the ability to have two swords and then going forward to make the continuity better. If it's, at some point, he just gets comfortable with two swords and he leaves it that way. So um, I wanted to keep him to where he's, he's a swordsman, mm -hmm. first and foremost. He's the powerful person of the group. I wouldn't say powerful. They're all pretty equal, but they're all the strong muscle. in their own right. Right. Um, also, also as, as I look further at it, I'm getting flashbacks to beat the Vandal Buster for some reason. Um, Actually, and I, I didn't have any inspiration for the Stro Sword. I just I just wanted him to have a sword. That's it. <laughs> uh, um, nothing mystical about it. Nothing that's calling to him or anything like that. Like. I might get instances to where I might write it into where he's able to like wield his sword, like mm -hmm. how Thor is able to, you know, summon Mjolnir and stuff like that, because mm -hmm. there are one and the same. But I mean, in terms of coming up with the concept of, you know, this is chosen sword or anything like that, it, there was Not, nothing like that. I I didn't I didn't mean it in a ch in a chosen sword or anything like that. It was just it was just a inference when it came to the um the design motif. Right. Um. 
Well, see, I didn't design a sword. I, I, I hired my artist who was helping me color a few comic books mm -hmm. for some clients. I hired him to come up with weapons because he's really good at, at making this, uh, making good weapons. His name is uh, Ronnie Reyes. He's over in the Philippines, and he does mm -hmm. a great job. If you tell him what you want, like I told him, I want a, a cool-looking sword. Mm -hmm. And he was like, hold my beer. I got this. <laughs> and he drew this sword. I'm like, I love it. I love how you have the black on top of the gold, and then you have the blade, and you have this glowing hilt. I love it. Fantastic. First try he did it. I fell in love with the sword because before I was drawing my own swords um, and it just didn't work out. I, I, I didn't, the blade is easy coming out with the hilt is okay, but the designs that he did in the central, central part of the blade, that was really an eye catcher for me. And I loved it so much. Mm -hmm. Now, but, but I know I'm gonna have a nightmare drawing that over and over again. Those, those, those designs. I just know <laughs> it. So. Well, it hurt. It's get. It's gonna hurt when you rip off a band aid. But all you can do is just grip it and rip it. Right, and that's the thing. Is like this is why I'm taking. I'm not giving myself a month deadline to draw a chapter anymore because I want people to get immersed in the art. I want to mm -hmm. be able to take my time and make these more manga esque pages because before I wasn't. Um, the the art is still pretty good there. I like it, but now I'm figuring out how to add tones. And and um and what's the other word tones and um I can't think of the other word but they're tones that are being added now because I've finally learned how to use those properly and looking really really good the more I do them so I'm I'm really excited for the art um that is going to come out in later issues and so hopefully you guys like them too yeah now with so with so with that with that kind of thing in in mind um when I, there's are, um you've you've been putting you've been putting out chapters on your website and and gradually putting them on um, webtoon is it a case where it's get where it's gonna or the next chapter would go on your website first and then after a while it would go on um, webtoon you know what I'm not really updating on webtoons anymore because I've had a lot of people ask me do I have to make an account on webtoons because I, I don't want to do that and it's actually costed me few readers because a lot of people don't want to create an account to read one book and a lot of people didn't even know webtoons existed so this is why i retrofitted my website to house these pages in the comic book so it's, i think webtoons is a good five six chapters behind mm -hmm. i haven't been updating it because no one really goes to webtoons and reads it people are mostly they go to my website and they go and read there heroicstudiosmedia.com because it's easier they don't need to log in they don't need to create an account they don't need to have anything they just need to click on the website type it into their browser click on read now because it's right there when you get to the website and you're done and it's mm -hmm. been i've gotten a lot more traffic doing it that way versus updating webtoons and before i used to update my website first on fridays and then update webtoons on sunday then the traffic was overwhelmingly unanimous on my website versus wasting the time to update it on webtoons because no one was going to webtoons to read it. Mm -hmm. And with taking up now, with all that said, I will I will certainly be keeping a clo a close eye on how how your um uni how your universe develops in the in the coming months. Um. And I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come up to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. That's I I'm glad you invited me. This is actually the first interview I've had uh, regarding the manga. So I hope that other people who are listening to this would you know if you want me to come on the show, it'd be great. I know I have another person who was trying to reach out to me on Twitter, but I've been eternally banished from that platform. So I don't know if they know where to find me at. Mm -hmm. But of course, of course, any anytime you see fit to return, the door the door is always open. As I as I often as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Hey man, I'm having a drink right now. This is what it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course, and of course, a of course a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then...
On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.